practical advice about a specific situation that we as a church family are on the cusp of right now. It's always good to let the Bible set the terms. Uh, Let God's Word set the tone is one of my favorite phrases. And that is why we do read through uh, whole books of the Bible here at St. Augustine's. As we did at the start of this year, we worked through the first few chapters of the Gospel of John. It was wonderful. We're going to pick up where we left off later after the summer. But we also know that God's Word has specific things to say to us about specific subjects, subjects that we do need careful and patient teaching on. That's why I like to alternate working through books of the Bible with specific themes. We've done a number of weeks this past month on giving because it's such an important part of the life of a disciple of Jesus. But we've also done themes like grace, the kingdom of God, uh, the heart, some that we've done in recent times. And sometimes we need to go to the word for specific advice on specific things. And that is today. Today I want to do a one-off to go to God's Word and talk really practically and pastorally, I hope, about what we'll be doing together as a church family starting next Sunday, which is welcoming a new curate among us, welcoming a new member of our pastoral team. These are really exciting times for us as a church. I hope you're excited. I am that Sarah Hall is joining us as a curate. Can we put the slide up that we have uh, uh, during the notices so we can see Sarah's picture? Sarah and Phil, is that possible? Um, Sarah's ordination is happening, thank you, on Saturday morning at uh, Berry Cathedral. So next Sunday is her first Sunday with us as curate, and we want to make both of our services, 9 o'clock and 10.30, real celebrations. Straight after the 10.30 service, which is an all-together service, so it's even more exciting than normal, we're going to have lunch together. Trusting for great weather, trusting for a day like today. Um, Next door in the Vicarage Garden, we'll open that up, possibly leak out across uh, elsewhere in the site. Uh, You can bring a picnic, uh, but we'll also have free food. We're going to have a free barbecue uh, there, so you don't need to bring your own picnic. There'll also be a bouncy castle Uh, There's going to be games uh, for anyone who wants to take part. Uh, We are going to have free ice creams. There's going to be pims, I believe, which is exciting. It is going to be great. Please make sure you're there if you can be. Uh, We're going to start straight after the 10.30 service uh, next Sunday morning. The first answer to the question is, how do we welcome a new curate? Be there, please. Be there to welcome Sarah and Phil. It's not a party unless you're there too. But besides a big party, uh, what else do we need to be thinking about as a church family about how to welcome a new minister among us, a curate among us, a new member of the team? Someone we believe God is bringing to us to help us become more of what he's called us to be as his people. And we're going to read a chunk of scripture together. If you have a Bible with you, and I do encourage you to bring a Bible with you to church, do turn with me, please, to Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. About this far through the New Testament, if that's any help to you, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Uh, Past the big letters, uh, past Romans and Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians, into Thessalonians. And I'm going to read from chapter 5 and verses 12 through to 18 this morning. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through to 18. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. 
thanks be to God. Bit of terminology first to make sure we're all on the same page. Sarah is joining us as a curate. Lots of you might not know what a curate is. A curate, curate the word, comes from the Latin word cura, which means care or concern. Anglicans talk about clergy sharing in the cure of souls with our bishops. And you can understand that to mean basically the care of souls. A curate is someone who cares for people and specifically their souls. In our passage, verse 12 says this, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord. And that is essential to the role, care. Plainly and simply, Sarah is coming to care for our church family, for you, together with me and our bishops. And we care for you in the Lord. We need that, don't we? Our community needs that, doesn't it? People listen to what we have to say about the Lord Jesus when they know we care for them. And doing that means that she will have to, as Paul puts it, work hard among us. Curates have a tough gig, actually. It's not a, a three-year work placement. It's work and it's ministry and it's training. It's all of those things. Curates are kind of apprentices. They are doing the job while learning to do the job. And that is not an easy thing to do in public with people watching. There is lots to learn, no matter how much experience or enthusiasm you come with. Curates don't come at a fixed age. They don't come with a fixed amount of ability or experience. Some come with lots of experience, particularly of caring, and Sarah does so pleased, incredibly blessed, I think, that Sarah's coming to us, having spent much of her career as a midwife, and a midwife locally as well. So she knows the area, and she knows what it means to care for people. She's got a naturally caring demeanor. But other parts of the job will be a challenge. So it's going to be hard work. Curates have to balance the responsibilities of being in one parish, here in our parish, with other things that they are asked to do by the bishop. There is ongoing training to be done. There's, there's work, there's written work, there's what's called formation on an ongoing basis. And that's going to take up her time, it's going to take up her evenings sometimes, even whole days, even longer than that sometimes. We have a good portion of her time, but we don't have all of it. And she has a very full schedule. She is going to work hard among us, as Paul puts it. Please, when you're with Sarah, acknowledge her for working hard. We all know the old joke. We know what you do on Sundays, but what do you do the rest of the week? It's not a funny joke. <laughs> this is a hard job, ministry. And a curate's job is really hard. The truth is, not everybody makes it through curacy. Some people get as far as curacy and they discover that actually they can't do it full time as a job. Let's not be the reason, I don't think we will be, but let's not be the reason Sarah becomes discouraged. And joining a big church like ours brings with it lots of additional challenges, just figuring out how things work. I mean, I've been here two and a half years, I'm still figuring out how some things work. Who does what? why things are done the way they are. Let's show her loads of grace, especially, practical point, with things like learning names. Imagine coming into a new place where 200 people altogether perhaps know your name. <laughs> you hardly know any. Let's remember that on top of many other things, this is a hard job and she will be working hard among us. So Paul says, Verse 13, hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Lord, would you help us to do that? Okay, let's read on. Here's Paul again talking about how we should relate to our leaders, including a new curate. 
Live in peace with each other. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. This is great because sometimes, just sometimes, your leaders let you down. I let you down. I know I do. And Sarah and other leaders among us may at some point let you down too. Here in Thessalonica, it appears that they have had some leaders who were being idle and disruptive, are the words that are used. Now, I don't expect for a second that we will find Sarah to be either of those things. But sometimes, just sometimes, we as your leaders don't meet the expectations you have for us. And when leaders let us down, what should we do? Criticize them on Facebook? No. Grumble about them to our friends? No. Ask for a meeting with the bishop to talk about them? No, not at first anyway. Here's what you should do, according to Paul. You should aim to, his words, live in peace with each other. Elsewhere, he says, be diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. Jesus himself teaches very clearly in Matthew 5 that reconciliation should happen at the lowest possible level. It should happen at the most local possible level, at the one-to-one level, the face-to-face level. Someone sinned against you, or you're aware that someone has something against you, you're to go to them. Go and speak to them. Go direct to them. Keep it as local as possible, as contained as it's possible to do. And there are three things likely to help you with that, and Paul lists them. As you meet with them, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Paul says, encourage them. More about that in a second. If they're feeling weak, do what you can to help them. And in any case, be patient with them. Encourage them if they're disheartened. Perhaps the reason that they're not giving 100% is because they're just disheartened. They need courage. Give them courage. The word courage comes from the Latin word for heart, cur, heart. Courage is strength of heart. Have you noticed that the enemy seeks to take our courage, to discourage us? Let's not be part of the enemy's scheme to discourage Sarah or our leaders. God's will for us is that we give one another encouragement. So be quick with a word of encouragement. Four of the sweetest possible words for me to hear are, you're doing so well. You're doing so well. I believe courage is the currency of the kingdom. Encouragement builds capital. We build up the church with the power of our words of encouragement. Picture it this way. Every word of encouragement to someone else builds them up which of course means because we're all the church, the whole church is built up. Remember Paul's teaching last week in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, he was talking about generosity with money, and he said this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Let's not sow sparingly with our encouragement. Let's so generously. Pastor Craig Groeschel says it this way. Every time you think something good about someone, share it. Never rob someone of the blessings of an unspoken treasure. I love that. Never rob someone of the blessings of an unspoken treasure. See how that language of currency, of wealth, of treasure is coming through. Please don't wait for a moment of brilliance to encourage Sarah, although I'm sure we'll see many moments of brilliance in her. 
but be actively on the lookout for reasons to encourage her. The tense of the verb in the letter to the Thessalonians is active, present, continuous. In other words, it means not just encourage, but encourage and keep on encouraging. Encourage and keep on encouraging. The goal is to keep on doing it habitually, and it's a good habit to get into, to encourage one another, and particularly, Paul says, your leaders. Do you know what? A person doesn't have to be doing brilliantly on every front to be worthy of encouragement. A person doesn't have to be delivering a perfect 10 every week in order to be worth a word of encouragement. There'll be something about almost everything that Sarah does that will be worthy of encouragement right from the get-go. And as we encourage her, she will grow faster, she will find her wings, she will become the person that she is meant to be by the power of our encouragement. Isn't that extraordinary? And by the way, there is collateral blessing in encouragement. It is a contagious thing. As you give others encouragement, you will find yourself encouraged. And I promise you, it won't come across as patronizing. You might think, oh, it'll sound patronizing. It never does. It won't come across as flattering either. What I find when people encourage me is actually, it makes me more aware of the grace of God in my life. It makes me more aware of what God is doing in and through me. And so ultimately, it goes up anyway. And don't just speak words of encouragement, write them down. Send texts, send emails, write note cards. Note cards are so beautiful to receive. So here we are a week out from Sarah arriving. She'll be here with us literally in a week's time. Why don't you ask God for a word for her this week? Why don't you ask God for a verse or a promise to share with her? Write it down in a card to greet her with a word of encouragement as she arrives showing that we're, we're starting as we mean to go on. Huh? How about that? And what about a gift? It's not just uh, words that encourage us, it's also actions and gifts. For me, this is often around coffee. <laughs> I'll never forget this. In my first week here in the job, Bev showed up at my door with not one, but two cups of coffee. She'd obviously heard I love coffee. She said, I didn't know if you prefer latte or cappuccino, so I got you both. And you've no idea how encouraging that was. I was brand new. I was really insecure. And that was huge for me. Dan and Helen sometimes show up at my door with a big canister of American coffee. And every time they show up, it feels like a massive encouragement. What a blessing. Just before we went on holiday last year, an envelope popped through our door with an encouraging note and some spending money for our holidays. So encouraging. We have got some good encouragers here at St. Augustine, so I want to encourage you to flex your encouragement muscle at this moment. I don't think in all of my years, leading in various ways, leading worship, leading from the front, leading here at St. Augustine's, I don't think I've ever come across someone who was too encouraged. I know I've never felt too encouraged. There is always room for building other people up. So let's sow encouragement generously. And finally, for this morning, can I tell you what the greatest encouragement is for me as your pastor? It is when you live out those verses we read, verses 16, 17, and 18. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you, in Christ Jesus. I'll read that again. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Nothing gives me more strength, more hope, more optimism for the future, more cheer, more courage than when I see you living like this, living a life of rejoicing, showing up to prayer meetings, offering to pray with me, hearing you pray out on a Sunday or on a Thursday. Nothing gives me more strength than when you come to me and you tell me a story about 
Even though life is hard right now, you are giving thanks in all circumstances. Because I know at that moment, you are living right in the bullseye of God's will for you. That's what Paul says. At that moment when you've got rejoicing overflowing out of you, when you are praying habitually, continually, reflexively, and when even when things are hard, you are giving thanks. I know right then you are bang in the middle of God's will for you. And as a pastor, there is no better feeling. I love these words from Jim Reish. Rejoice means to rejoy, to call back your joy, to get refilled with joy. We rejoice by choice. We are joyful by an act of right thinking and an act of the will. We can be joyful even when we don't feel like it or when circumstances are bad. Joy is supernatural. It does not rely on the external, but is based on the internal. Who's in you? Jesus. We are to be joyful in the Lord, regardless of whether things are good or bad. We are most the church. We are being most faithful to Jesus when we rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. That's how you encourage me. That is how you will encourage Sarah. And this is how we'll encourage one another in this exciting new season in the life of our church family. There we go. A short encouragement on a hot day. Can I invite you to stand? And we're going to make a response to God this morning as Tim leads us in another song.